Electroplating is one of the most common coating processes used for computer hardware. It's used to nickel coat cold plates and heat spreaders especially, as cooling solutions often use nickel plating as a protective coat for underlying copper. Electroplating with nickel has minimal loss of transfer efficiency for the underlying metal and provides maximum protective benefit against things like exposure to air and prolonged use. Electroplating joins painting, electrodeposition, and anodization as the main ways a computer part is coated. In this video, we'll explain how electroplating works, including an explanation of how nickel plating for coolers works, and this is all done in our factory tour series from when we visited Taipei in early March. Before that, this video is brought to you by Gigabyte Aorus RTX 2080 Ti Extreme. The RTX 2080 Ti Extreme is built with a triple axial cooling solution and ready for anyone interested in intermediate GPU overclocking although it's also up for gaming out of the box. The Gigabyte 2080 Ti can reach the higher performance range required to play games at frame rates at and beyond 144 FPS, coupled particularly well with games like Call of Duty Warzone, Rainbow Six Siege, and other competitive FPSs. Gigabyte's Extreme is built to be a looker for system builders going for extra visual flair. Learn more at the link in the description below. The second coating factory that we toured with Lian Lee specialized in electroplating, a process used to coat one metal with another. The process itself strongly resembles electrodeposition and anodization methods that we've also detailed in factory tour videos. You can find our factory tour playlist linked in the description below if you'd like to see some of the other tours to learn more about how the stuff you buy is actually made. Electroplating is a specific subcategory of electrodeposition, meaning these parts are dunked in fluid and zapped with electricity. Today we'll be covering rack plating, barrel plating, and the elaborate filtering process this factory uses to prevent dumping toxic chemicals into the environment. This factory electroplates metals using two different methods, rack plating and barrel plating. Rack plating is the most closely related to the anodization and EPD processes that we've seen thus far, but this factory is larger than the others we've visited and has some unique features. First, the parts are placed on conductive metal racks and washed off. The racks may look like they're fully sleeved in insulation from a distance, but they're topped with thick copper hooks and the prongs that contact the parts are also bare metal. Rack plating is more expensive and laborious than barrel plating, which we'll cover next, but it offers better control over the finish of each individual part. Rack plating is better suited to large, fragile, or complex items, as well as decorative items, since it offers precise control over rack marks, or points where the coating is missing due to contact with the metal rack. We spotted VGA slot covers being plated at the time of our visit, but this factory also rack plates PCIe expansion slot covers like for network devices, motherboard trays, and various other case parts for companies including Lee & Lee. They plate much more than decorative PC components, however, like headphone jacks, seat buckles, and even fittings for scuba diving gear. This is a large factory that has its hands in everything. There's a strong chance you've encountered something that was plated in this factory, potentially in your car, your computer, or in your other hobbies. Thorough cleaning is absolutely vital for electroplating to work, so each rack gets dunked into four separate cleaning agents. Each dip lasts up to two minutes, followed by a water rinse and the next chemical for a total cleaning time of about eight minutes. Since the soaking time required for all chemicals is equal, the conveyor chain dips all the racks on the line into their respective chemicals at the same time, so every part of the cleaning process is constantly happening simultaneously and doesn't require the same degree of manual oversight as the anodization factory water tanks that we saw previously. After cleaning the racks comes electroplating, which doesn't look much different from cleaning. Electroplating is a process where individual positively charged metal molecules, or cations, dissolved in an electrolyte solution are reduced the opposite of oxidation. They're reduced onto an object to be plated using an electric current. The object to be plated is the negative electrode, or cathode, of the circuit. The positive electrode, or the anode, is either composed of the plating metal, in which case it's dissolved as part of the plating process, or is non-consumable, in which case the cations are pre-dissolved in the bath and have to be refreshed occasionally. This is the part of the process where the conductive metal racks come in. Cleaning doesn't involve electricity. Three of the dunking bins are dedicated to actual electroplating, and these are held to a temperature between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius to raise the conductivity of the electrolyte fluid. Plating takes 20 or more minutes, and moving a rack through the entire line of cleaning, rinsing, and plating takes roughly an hour, after which the racks are removed and blown dry with an air compressor. 
The more unique of the two processes used at this factory is barrel plating. Here, small parts are placed in a non-conductive plastic barrel full of tiny holes looking somewhat like a lottery drum and spun in the same sort of cleaning and electrolyte baths as the racks. Cleaning is done on the shorter of the two lines under a structure that resembles a greenhouse, which acts as a fume hood to capture and remove harmful vapor, piping it up to a network of blue ducts on the roof that scrub toxins from the air and make it breathable again. The rooftop cleaning solution is extensive and spans multiple stories of the building, including a complex network of tanks, tubs, ducts, and filters, and is something we'll talk about in more detail later. The cleaning process for the small parts being coated in barrels takes an hour, as opposed to eight minutes for the larger rack-mounted parts. This method of plating makes it easy to process large quantities of small parts uniformly, but the tumbling and random contact between the parts means that it's not the most precise method and it's only usable for parts that are compact and simple enough to roll around each other in the barrel. For example, it's hard to get a thick layer of plating on the inside of small tubes that are barrel coated at this factory. But in this case, it's deemed acceptable because the inside of the tube isn't seen. Customers pay a premium to have items rack coated by exact count, but barrel coating is simply done by weight. This section of the factory uses small cranes on rails to lift the barrels in and out of each chemical bath like miniature versions of the cranes used at the anodization factory, and the electric contact points that they're lifted onto for plating also bear a strong resemblance. Each barrel has its own metal frame with contact points and a cog to interface with the crane. The tumbling action isn't constant. The crane must occasionally move over, lift up a barrel, spin it, and drop it back down. Inside the barrel are thick electrical cables with bare copper contacts on the end that roll around and maintain contact with the items being plated. There are multiple different types of barrels in use. Barrels with bigger holes are more efficient and have less impedance for water moving in and out, but smaller holes are necessary to keep the parts from falling out of the barrels or from getting stuck, so it just depends on what's being made. Applying a layer of plating in a barrel takes 30 minutes, but some coatings are multi-layer. Nickel plating, for example, often uses a copper base coat, so the process takes an hour total. This factory plates with multiple different metals, sometimes including gold for gold-plated objects. At the end of this line, the barrels are opened up and dumped out into a tub of running water lined with a net. Workers then manually gather up the net and dunk it in a series of acidic chemicals and water to clean and rinse the parts, then place the bundle in a centripetal dryer mounted to a truck tire and spin it for a few seconds to get the excess fluid out. Bits Power uses the same type of dryer, and despite looking jury-rigged, it's actually a standard solution. The large truck tire helps absorb the violent force and is an easy, effective solution. The net is next emptied out onto a tray and raked out for visual inspection with a tool resembling a back scratcher. For customers who require a coating to be more decorative than functional, like Lian Li, the company can simply replate the parts to cover up any flaws. For small components with tight functional tolerances, flaws in the plating require stripping the existing plate and redoing the whole process. Nobody wants flawed coatings on cold plates, seat belt buckles, or scuba gear, so this part of the process is important for making sure the customer gets the product as it was intended to look. Speaking of which, the factory does offer an extra touch that has nothing to do with electroplating for some of the components that it plates, like seat belt buckles. These are baked in ovens on the second floor to give them extra strength against shearing force as are other parts that may be exposed to any type of force as a strengthening method. There's a series of imposing tanks kept downstairs near the plating line that resemble gas canisters, but these are simply used for filtering and holding the production line's water supply. The factory needs a constant supply of completely clean water and produces a constant supply of dangerously polluted water. Therefore, a large portion of the factory is set aside for filtering waste. This factory specifically is used as a case study by the Taiwanese government because of the effort they invest in filtration. The government and the factory bring representatives in from other companies to do tours to better understand why the process works here. The building has multiple stories, but only the ground floor actually does electroplating. Other than ovens and QA testing, the upper floors are occupied by this elaborate filtration process. The cleaned water flows through pipes down to the garage on the ground floor, where it passes through an open-air basin for drop-by surprise inspection by the Taiwanese government. Water released at the end must be clean enough to meet the Taiwanese government standards, and from what we understand with all three of the factories we looked at that do this, it's not something that they tell you about. They just come by and check. 
Upstairs is where the magic happens. We were told that the huge tanks lined up side by side are specifically for use in the filtering process, not for electroplating. These tanks contain NaOH, or sodium hydroxide, or lye, PAC, or polyaluminum chloride, H2SO4, or sulfuric acid, and NaOCI, or sodium hyperchlorite. There was also a tank simply labeled polymer, as well as bags of activated carbon nearby, the ubiquitous old filtration material. The first step is to take orange buckets of these chemicals and mix them with the polluted water. Vertical electric motors are scattered throughout the upper floors of the factory and used to agitate water and mix everything thoroughly. When this cocktail of chemicals is mixed with polluted water, it solidifies the pollutants and allows them to settle out as a concrete substance at the bottom, which can be scooped out for further processing. The two-story teal hoppers are specifically for allowing the water to sit so that this solidified waste can settle out and the settled material is monitored by eye to ensure that the correct particle size is being produced. Once the wet but solid waste is gathered in bags, it can be loaded into the next stage, a pneumatic press that rings out any remaining water. It's powered by a giant air compressor to the side, and the pressure gauge on the press read 2500 psi, or 175 kilograms per centimeter squared at the time of recording. Burning waste is commonplace, but the waste from this factory contains metals that make it especially dangerous to burn. The solid waste is instead squeezed into bags and shipped off to a recycling or reclamation center, which reclaims some of the metal. The really dangerous chemicals that can't be recycled or made use of at all are siphoned off into a small tank, which is taken away for disposal every six months. Electroplating isn't the most expensive process Lian Li uses for coating metal, but it isn't the cheapest either, at least in Taiwan. Anodization tops the list for cost followed by painting and standard powder coating, and then electroplating, and then electrodeposition. Each has its strengths and weaknesses, and the desired surface finish must be balanced against the cost and durability of each process. With the entire production and cleanup process finished, the plated pieces can move on to QC on the second floor. The simplest part of this process is just another conveyor chain where workers remove finished pieces from racks, inspect them by eye, and pack them in boxes to be sent back to the customers. The more complex part of QC is the room where the factory does stress testing, as well as internal QC of its own manufacturing process. A salt spray tester like the one we previously saw in Cooler Master's factory is used to test the endurance of protective coatings on things like diving gear, scuba gear, things that will be subjected to harsh conditions but the degree of testing done here is up to the customer. Some customers might say it's okay for corrosion or damage within 24 hours of salt spray testing, while others might disallow any damage to appear ever. This is also where the mixture of chemicals used in electroplating and in filtering must be checked carefully every day, and where a tiny version of the electroplating drums used downstairs is used for prototyping. This mini drum was supplied by the same company as the full-sized version and works the same way but it's transparent for easier visibility while testing. Specific materials must be used for the drums and tubs to withstand the toxic chemicals used in the process. This covers the entire electroplating process from start to finish. Check our channel for our already published videos on things like anodization for aluminum parts and for upcoming videos in our factory tour series. Watch our coverage of Bits Powers Factory for another example of a company that contracts out for electroplating but does a bunch of stuff in-house, mostly CNC work. Thanks for watching, subscribe for more, and to support this type of content, go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching, we'll see you all next time.